then I will let Roger start his uh, talk. So thank you again for joining and let's just hear uh, Roger's talk. Roger, you are free to start whenever you want. Yeah, okay. Okay, the, today I, uh, I will talk about the open list object datasets. So the dataset is uh, designed for the lifelong deep learning problems. So uh, we're doing this because we found that a lot of lifelong uh, deep learning methods that cannot work very well in the robotic scenarios when we deploy the robot in the real world in environments. So the robot can uh, always encounter the objects that's under different uh, illuminations, and also the uh, objects can be um, calculated by other objects. So also the distance and the angles of the camera between the objects and the um, robot cameras uh, are very different. So these are all the difficulties when we apply the lifelong learning algorithms in the real world environment. So how can we, the, the question is how can we validate um, if we develop such perception models like the object recognition, detection, or segmentation algorithms? Uh, under the lifelong learning manner. So actually, we, we need to have a novel object datasets and benchmark designed for quantifying such algorithms. So that's why we uh, propose such datasets and uh, propose some benchmark methods for quantifying the lifelong learning algorithms. So here is the uh, um, platforms of the open data datasets. So actually, we mounted different sensors uh, with the uh, cameras, uh, RGBD cameras, the laser, and also uh, some um, IMU. So this, this data sets, uh, the cameras, the sensors is quite, um, mm, it's quite difficult to align the, the old data calibrated very well. So actually we're using the RGBD data sets uh, in the open Lawrence object data sets. And also we have another data set called uh, Open Lawrence Sense. The Sense dataset is designed for uh, benchmarking the lifelong SLAM methods. So and today I talk about the object recognition. So we're only using the RGBD um, cameras. So it has RGB and the depth uh, images. Uh, so this is one of the um, samples, some of the samples taken from different views. So actually um, we're doing this because um, we found when the objects um, moving around the um, the robots moving around the objects, so it can see the objects from the different views. So it can get a lot of uh, um, data uh, from the objects when 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 the robots encountering different illuminations or even with some occlusions. So we quantify this this kind of difficulties uh, explicitly. So we compared with some of the um, data sets. That's um, for the object recognition. So as, uh, as this table one shown, so the open Lawrence object data sets um, has uh, uh, explicitly quantifies uh, all the illumination, the occlusion, and also the final dimension of the objects in the images. So and um, also we um, get the data on the different scenarios. For example, we get data uh, at the home, on the office, and also the uh, campus and the shopping mall. And also the data set is uh, acquired by the real robot mounted with the RGBD cameras. So the, 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 the real world challenges is uh, explicitly um, quantified in the data sets. So our data set is separated with different difficulty levels. So this is one of our main contributions in the lifelong learning. And also, this is the difficulty levels of the uh, object recognition. We separate uh, three levels. Um, for the easy one is the level one. So the illumination is very strong. It's, uh, it's, uh, 
is the occlusion is zero uh, percent. Uh, so and uh, the objects you can see the objects very well, and also the object size in the images is larger than two hundred times two hundred pixels. For the level two, so uh, the illumination sometimes is uh, is not good enough. And also, it can the target object is occulted by some other objects. So you need to remove the um, the objects you, you you didn't want to recognize. So this is a this is also very challenging. So uh, the highest level of difficulty is uh, with the illumination is very weak, and also it has a lot of um, percentage of the uh, target objects has been occulted by others. Uh, the total number of the uh, instance is 121. So all the, all the objects is collected from 20 different senses. Um, besides the classification problems, so we also consider uh, to make the um, benchmark as the lifelong um, object detection or the segmentation tasks. So we provide some uh, bounding box and also the mask of the objects and also, um, for the first version uh, version of the open Loris objects, we didn't provide the um, bounding box and the mask. But now, um, we provide the, the bounding box and the segmentation, the mask informations. So here is two examples. And also, we uh, utilize the four different evaluation metrics for quantifying the lifelong learnings. So actually, uh, as we can see, the uh, the learning accuracies and uh, this this matrix is uh, the same. The column is the, we training on some of the task, and the uh, the row is that indicate we testing on different uh, uh, other tasks. So the triangle of the matrix, um, the bottom triangle of the matrix means uh, means that. Actually, the memorization capabilities of the model on the previous task, and also the uh, forward um, transfer is the generalization capability of the model is uh, uh, another yellow indicated. So the overall accuracy is, is the overall performances of uh, all the tasks you have tested. So the first benchmark model is uh, called the single factor analyze. So we uh, separate uh, different uh, um, tasks. So for example, the illumination is uh, task one. And also, um, we, we set the learning order of these challenges when we change the different illumination uh, of the objects when the robot encounter. So uh, the, the, the second is the occlusion, and also the object pixel size, and also the final, the clutter information. So then this, the benchmark one uh, intends to investigate, investigate how the learning order of uh, different uh, difficulty levels can influence the uh, lifelong learning uh, capabilities of the system. Uh, this is also the, uh, another um, uh, quantified results of the nine lifelong learning algorithms. So, and Actually, the backward and the transfer accuracy is uh, uh, very low um, across all the uh, methods we investigate. So, so each node of the spider chart is one method, such as the EWC or WF methods. And also the um, multitask methods uh, seems to be the best. It's uh, um, an accumulated methods, cumulative. So this method is based, I think this is an overfitting problem. So the, this method using all the data to uh, training the model and then do the testing. And also the, the second uh, benchmark is the sequential factor. So we concatenate all the different environment challenges together. And then they encounter different level of difficulties. So it's uh, together we have the 12, different tasks. So each uh, each challenge has three difficulty levels. So they will encounter four challenges with uh, three difficulty le levels each. And also for the 
um, for the accuracies, the four different metrics of the nine uh, algorithms, we have found the accuracy still is very low. It's a lot of problems such as uh, um, backward transfer, the uh, forgetting problem hasn't been solved very well. So here the conclusion is that actually the bottlenecks of developing perception system is uh, uh, the major is the forward transfer. And because the, I, th I think the uh, all the lifelong learning methods is focused on the uh, overcoming this kind of uh, problem of backward transfer. So all the methods uh, performs very well because it uh, can avoid the catastrophic forgetting problems. But a lot of continual learning methods um, didn't focus much on the forward transfer. So it's another field um, like the transfer learning and the domain adaptation. So um, the second conclusion is uh, uh, under the ever-changing difficulty levels, when the task is uh, longer, so the accuracy is drops sharp, sharply. So the performance of all the state-of-the-art methods degrade. The third is that I think the open artist object is uh, also one of the novel RGBD datasets designed for quantifying the lifelong learning algorithms. So the final is uh, uh, actually we provided the datasets on online. So actually this is one of the paper accepted at the ICRA uh, this year. So we collect uh, the main contribution is from uh, Intel, the Tsinghua University and the City University of Hong Kong. So we have provided also our sample codes um, implement how to utilize the data set and how to quantify with nine lifelong learning algorithms using open knowledge data sets. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Roger, for your presentation. Uh, does anyone has a specific question we can ask Roger uh, so that we can move right away? Uh, the next presentation and then we can have an extended, let's say, Q&A session at the end of the four spotlight votes. Hi, can I can I ask a question? Of course, of course, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, Roger. So my question is, uh, compa compared to the current deep learning methods, for, uh, like for each task, you use a separate model and compared to the current state, of algorithms, what is the advantage of continual learning? I think that uh, uh, it's, it's still in the research stage and uh, Yes, yeah, I think the, the advantage of uh, continual learning, the mainstream of continual learning methods is uh, focusing on um, we, we can keep the accuracy of your system doesn't degrade. So actually, if you want to learn new tasks uh, for yeah. the standard deep learning methods, your system performance after training with the new data, the performance will drop, sometimes drop a lot when you're testing on the older data sets. But the uh, mainstream of the... Okay. What about like for the old task, you can just use the old model and for new task, uh, you can just use a, train another new model. So you have two models right now, and for different yeah. tasks, you use different models. Does, uh, does it seem to be better? Yeah, uh, this is called the parameter isolation methods in the continual learning. So someone investigated this kind of methods, but I think it's not efficient in the real world applications. We cannot do uh, a lot of models for different tasks, actually. We need to find their shared structure or the shared knowledge across similar tasks. So that's uh, what, what the continual learning wants to explore. Okay, so uh, what about, so what is the reason for n not being efficient? Does it because uh, such as the, uh, the, the storage for different models or the training time for different models? And uh, so is it is it that reason? Uh, you mean the efficient? Yeah. So compared to the uh, multiple models for multiple tasks and and continual learning methods. So what what is the reason for 
not being efficient. Okay, so the, the efficient means uh, uh, such as uh, um, latency or for the inference. So also the lightweight model can increase your um, inference speed and also can increase your uh, um, training speed and also okay. the model storage, the model size. So such as this uh, um, metrics and also some power um, power management, uh, I mean the um, power yeah. consumption of your model when you actually use that. Okay, and last question yeah. is, uh, does, does continual, do, do continual learning algorithms have already applied in some real, real world robotic products? Um, actually, we are going to this direction now. Um, yeah, we, we're doing a lot of efforts on this in the Intel robotics platform. We have a platform called Hero platform. That's the, uh, we also have a SDK that's included uh, some of the continual learning algorithms already. But now um, the gap is, uh, uh, as we can see, we didn't have a large scale benchmark data sets to testing the lifelong learning algorithms applied to the real world scenarios. Yes. So we collect the data ourselves with some universities. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Great, I think Thank we you. can move this discussion also to the end. Uh, I will keep, you know, I will remind sure. the points that we touched now uh, and we, we can continue the discussion later on. But now let's uh, listen to the talk of Gabriele Graffietti from the University of Bologna, as I said. Uh, maybe Roger, you can yeah, switch out your presentation and Gabriele, you can Okay, I'll design. try. Okay. Do you see my slides here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now full screen. Okay. Can you hear me very well? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Gabriele Graffietti. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bologna in Italy. I'll talk about continual learning over small non ID batches of natural video streams. So, first of all, uh, what is, in my opinion, a uh, computer learning ideal application. So, for example, we have, uh, as I just said, a robot who wander in a room uh, or we have some uh, continual learning agent. A new object is discovered or is shown to this continual learning agent. The agent acquires a short video or acquires some data about this new object. And from the frame or from the data extracted from the stream, uh, one of small mini batches uh, are used for training. And those mini batches will contain a highly correlated patterns from a single class and a single object. So I, I see an object, I record a video of the object, and I want to, tra I want to uh, train my model, I want to train my continual learning agent to recognize this object. Uh, where is the problem here? Well, uh, having highly correlated pattern in every single data uh, mini batch. Uh, it's a problem for stochastic gradient descent because it doesn't work well in these settings. Uh, if I have uh, uh, only one uh, object in a, in a mini batch, uh, the optimization uh, is performed only on one object, so the forgetting is very, very high. And uh, I almost, uh, and the model almost uh, uh, forget uh, all the past knowledge. And um, for this reason, popular benchmarks such as C for ImageNet that uh, are now used in the by the continual learning community um, do not do not correlate well with this idea because uh, there are many different instances of the same class in every mini batch. This is uh, not natural. This is highly unlikely than uh, an application experience uh, this kind of behavior. Uh, for example, if I want to uh, train my, my model to recognize airplane, it's highly, un, it's highly unlikely that uh, in a moment I have a lot of images of a lot of different planes. It's more and more likely that I have some images or some data about one plane that I see now from different, uh, under different poses and in different angles. Uh, so, we want to deal with these uh, difficult, difficult settings, so uh, we use uh, Core 50, the Core 50 dataset to, um, 
to um, simulate these settings. Uh, Core 50 is composed of 50 classes divided in 10 categories, and there are five objects for, uh, for each category. And for, for each object, uh, 11 different video sessions are um, recorded. So uh, almost, uh, oh, sorry, uh, 300 frames for every session are recorded with a Kinect 2. Uh, over the Core 50 dataset, we build the uh, Nikvu 2 391 benchmark. Uh, which is a benchmark for continual learning. Uh, is a new instance and classes scenario. What it means? It means that uh, in a batch you can encounter a new class, so a class that you have never seen before, or you can encounter a different object of the same class or the same object if you have encountered before, but in a different uh, session, a different scenario with a different background, etc. This uh, benchmark is composed of 391 batches. This is why the number. And uh, every batch, every batch is um, composed of 300 images, apart from the fourth, which is 10 times larger. And only one object is present in every batch. So uh, every batch is composed only of one uh, singular uh, different video section. So in every batch, we have only one object, the same settings, the same background, the same illumination recorded in different, uh, different poses. Uh, this is an example of some images from the Core 50 dataset. So we have the 10 classes here. We have a plug, we have cell phone, uh, we have shifts or a check, etc. For each class, we have five instances. And uh, for every instances, we record a short video of, three, of 300 frames with different backgrounds, different illumination, etc. Et uh, so how we can deal with, uh, with this difficult benchmark? Well, our proposal is uh, this method, which is called AR1, which stands for Architectural and Regularization, because it uh, explores both architectural and regularization strategies. Uh, first of all, for the architectural strategy, uh, we concentrate ourselves in the head here, which is namely the last fully connected layer of the network. And we have uh, two heads. We have one head, which is the CW head, which is the consolidated weight head. And uh, at the start of each task, we create another head here, which is the TW head. It stands for temporary weight head. This head is initialized with uh, zero, all the, all the weights of this head are zero, apart from the weight corresponding to the class J, the class in the current batch. We have only one class per batch, so it's quite easy, which are copied from this head here in the, in the current position. We use this, uh, this head to train the network. And uh, after the training, we consolidate this weight here under over this, uh, this head here using this formula. Yeah, it's quite easy. Uh, the, um, the J stands for the, the weight associated with the current class J in the, in the batch. And W plus J is just a weight, which is uh, calculated as uh, the square root of the number of uh, example of class J uh, encountered in the in the batches before the, the considered one uh, over the number of um, example of the class J in the current batch. Uh, okay, for all the convolutional layer here, we use the synaptic intelligence to limit the update of important weights. Yeah, it's uh, synaptic intelligence is the kind of easy, so it exploits information made available by stochastic gradient descent, so it does not require any further gradient propagation, and uh, does not require to store all weight, so it can be done online. So we constrain the weight here by synaptic intelligence. And uh, these are the results. Uh, we should focus only on this, this more challenging benchmark here, which is uh, the NITW2 benchmark with 391 batches. Those are different, two different versions of the same benchmark, but with um, less number of batches. But we, we want the result in uh, this, which is more challenging. And uh, as we can see for the plot, uh, many continual learning uh, strategies, like uh, learning, with, learning without forgetting or elastic weight consolidation, totally fail to learn anything in the settings. Uh, DSLDA, which is Deep Streaming Discriminant, uh, discriminant Analysis, does pretty well. But uh, AIR-1, which is the method that I have already described, uh, is the best in this particular setting, reaching 
almost 57% of accuracy on all the test sets. So all the classes at the end of the training, testing on all the classes, nearly 57%. Uh, these are some other data. So the training time, the runtime of the training, which is, uh, which is quite good because it's almost 40 minutes. For example, the LSD8, 79 minutes, so it's quite more, almost, uh, almost uh, double time. And uh, no, no that is required, no more, no, no further data. Only 12 megabytes of parameters are uh, required uh, for uh, mainly for the synaptic intelligence pass. So we, are, we have reached 57%. Accuracy in this scenario is good, it's not so good. How we can improve it? Well, for example, we can improve it with replay. Uh, why replay? Well, because it's really, really straightforward, really, really easy to implement. So just store patterns here and replay them to the net through the network. So it's really, really straightforward, really, really easy to implement, and it's really effective. Um, an effect of replay in uh, with our algorithm, which is AR1, is that uh, there is no more need to constrain this weight here with synaptic intelligence because uh, replaying pattern uh, act as a constrainer, so uh, act as a refreshing for the memory. So there is no more need to constrain the weight and not changing them. So uh, our, our algorithm uh, becomes AR1 free, just stand for all the weights here are free to, um, to be changed as the, as the stochastic or the descent as the network wants. And moreover, if only few images per class are taken, uh, there is no critical impact on memory. So it's not a problem. Uh, those are the results with uh, using replay. So the dashed curve here is the AR1 um, algorithm that uh, I have I've, um, explained before without replay. Using only 1,500 replay patterns, we gain almost and more than 20 percent point in accuracy. So we are closing, really slowly closing the gap with the cumulative strategy, which is uh, the strategy, which is the, um, uh, the strategy of uh, which, yeah, it's, it's the training of the network having all the data. So uh, it's, uh, it's a sort of upper bound. I collect all the data and I train the network with all the data, not sequentially. Uh, I didn't uh, say it before, we used uh, a mobile net version one network for all the experiments. And uh, we used uh, images on uh, 128 by 128 dimension, uh, RGB, so three channels, the image of core 50. And we reach almost 77%, if I'm not wrong, using only 1,500 patterns on replay which are less than uh, 100 megabytes of memory. So we are happy, we are very happy. So yeah, we are resolved the, <laughs> the replay, the, sorry, the continual learning problem. It seems so, but uh, it's not so easy because replay, in fact, uh, inserts some problems in the, um, in the algorithm. Uh, first of them is here, replay memory. We need memory to store the pattern. In our setting, it's not a problem. Uh, we require um, less than 100 uh, megabytes. But uh, if you really want a really lifelong learning agent, this can be a problem. Just for example, if you have uh, a thousand classes like ImageNet, and we want to store only 20 pattern per class, we need almost four gigabytes of memory. So it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, a large amount of memory, especially for low level devices and uh, not a server or PC. But uh, the most important problem, and uh, the, the ugly one, <laughs> is that uh, uh, replay requires extra forward and backward steps. So the training time increased a lot. I'll explain it. So we have uh, the data here. The data, when I train the network, have, have to be here, goes in the forward pass. So we have to go through all through the network. Here I calculate the loss. And after I calculate the loss, the gradient has to be rate propagated, back propagated uh, through all the network again. If I uh, use uh, also replay pattern, this means that for every mini batch, all the replay pattern or um, a significant amount of them have to traverse the network in the back in the forward phase and calculate the loss here and have to 
um, backwarded, the loss have to be backwarded, so all the gradients have to be calculated for all the layers here. This highly um, increased the training time, increased the calculation required. And just an example, while while air one without uh, replay, it uh, it need uh, almost 40 minutes to train. Using only uh, 1,500 replay replay pattern requires more than two hours. So more than doubling the time using very very little replay memory. So this is the real problem. Not it's not the memory, it's the training time. We want to our model to be real time. We we don't want to wait. Uh, few minutes uh, to recognize and to train the model on only one object. So what is the, um, the solution for, uh, for this problem? Well, we can use latent replay. So not storing the input images here, but uh, uh, extracting some uh, activation of uh, some hidden layer here in the network, storing them and replaying them. Why? This is, uh, this is way better than storing input layer uh, input data. First of all, first of all, because uh, uh, usually uh, the feature of the network is crafted here are uh, um, are smaller than the input data, so they require less memory to be memorized, or in the same amount in the same amount of memory you can memorize more of them. Moreover, activation are usually um, are usually sparse. So they can be quantized or compressed with uh, negligible accuracy loss. So further, um, further um, decreasing the need of, for memory. But the most important thing is efficiency. I, I'll explain it that. In these settings, we have uh, the data here. So the data should, in the forward pass, traverse the network until here. Here we take some of the replay pattern. We concatenate with the data and both the data and the replay pattern have to traverse this part of the network. Here we calculate the loss. We backpropagate the gradient of the replay pattern and of the real data until here. And from here to the input layer, only the gradient of the real data is backpropagated. So we have a portion here of the network that is not uh, traversed by the replay data, speeding up very, very much the training because we don't need to um, we don't need the, the replay pattern to traverse all the all this part of network. Uh, obviously, this uh, this latent replay layer here can be moved. So, if it's moved towards the output layer, the portion of the network that have not to be traversed uh, by the latent uh, the latent the, um, the replay pattern increase. So, the speed up increased at a cost of a slightly uh, decreasing in the accuracy of the model. While if you want the top accuracy, we can move the latent uh, replay layer uh, towards the input layer. Uh, we need more computation because the portion of the network that have to be traversed by replay and uh, input data increases. But uh, the accuracy is, um, is higher than moving the replay layer on the opposite direction. Uh, there are some results here in the, in the plot here on the left. We have uh, the phenomenon that I explained before. So here we have the accuracy using uh, IR1 free with image replay, so the typical replay. And more we move the replay layer um, toward the, the end of the network, the upper layer toward the, the output layer, more the accuracy decreases. But as we see in um, later, the speed up is massive. Uh, here is the graph, is a plot of uh, the accuracy of some, um, some strategies and uh, some of these uh, changing uh, their latent replay layer. So here we have AR1 without any replay, the first method that I described. Here we have um, the uh, AR1 with latent replay using pool 6, so the last layer of the network has a replay layer and it's slightly there is a slightly advantage in accuracy, so it's likely better. If we use Conv 5.4 of the mobile net uh, version one of the of the net, or as a re replay layer, and which we think is, um, is a good trade-off between accuracy and speed up, we reach almost 75% in accuracy. So there is a huge gap between no replay and latent replay, almost 15 points. Uh, 
but uh, accuracy is not the, the only thing to consider. We need to consider also the runtime, the, also the speed, the computation required, and the memory overhead. I would like you to concentrate on these three uh, methods here. So there is AR1 without, uh, re without replay, the, the basic method. It requires nearly 40 minutes to, to train on all these, on all the NIC uh, 391 benchmark. No replay memory, just, just 12 megabytes of overhead for the synaptic intelligent parts. And it reached almost 56% of accuracy. Then we inserted a replay at the level of images, so traditional replay. We raised the accuracy by almost 20 points, so reaching 77% but the training time highly increases to more than two hours and we need 75 megabytes or of uh, external memory if we use uh, latent replay so at com 54 which is our internal layer of the mobile net uh, we re the time required to train all the model is almost the same of using no replay here 41 minutes versus 39 but the gap in accuracy is really huge because we passed from 50, 50, 56 sorry, to 72%, using only 48 megabytes of memory. And uh, to conclude, uh, regard, uh, comparing this method, so latent replay with um, traditional replay at the level of images, we, yeah, it's true that we, we lose some, uh, some accuracy, almost five points, but we use less memory and we gain a lot, a lot of um, speed up so we can train this model really, really faster. And uh, it can be used for, in, uh, for example, real-time application. It can be used in low power device. It can be used in a lot of different things that uh, this model here that use replay and need two hours to be trained can be used. Uh, so for future works, uh, one cool idea is to use uh, why storing. Yeah, the, the main idea is why storing this replay pattern. Why not generate it with a generative model? So we are working on it with uh, this kind of latent generative replay. Uh, other idea can be yeah, exploiting temporal coherence because we work with uh, um, with short videos. So all the patterns that we have in a mini batch are. Um, are bounded, um, yeah, there is some sort of temporal coherence, so we can exploit them, or on uh, other cool ideas, just uh, like open set classification or etc. active learning, there are some, just some ideas. Uh, thank you for, for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm here, I'm here after the, the presentation, I'm here on the Slack channel, on the forum, on the mail, everything you want, <laughs> and thank you again. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabriela. Um, okay, do we have a specific question for this talk? Um, otherwise, we, we can move the discussion directly at the end of the four talks. Okay, so let's move to the next talk, uh, this meetup. And Tyler Eyes from Rochester Institute of Technology. is She is going to present, remind your, net, your network uh, to prevent catastrophic forgetting. So thanks, Taylor, you can start presenting now. All right. Okay, uh, thanks everybody for having me. Oh, can you see my screen? Yes, 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 we can see. Okay. Um, thanks for having me uh, give this talk today. My name is Tyler Hayes. I'm a current PhD student at the Rochester Institute of Technology, and I'll be presenting our work, Remind Your Neural Network to Prevent Catastrophic Forgetting. Uh, so a quick outline, I'll give a brief overview of two popular incremental learning paradigms. I'll then talk about how replay is used to mitigate forgetting, except there's a couple of problems with current replay implementations. Uh, so then I'll talk about how we propose the Remind architecture to overcome these uh, limitations, I'll then present some experiments on image classification and visual question answering, and then I'll close out our talk. Um, so in incremental batch learning, we break a data set into several batches. At each time step, the learner first receives a batch of data that consists of one or more classes. The learner then loops through this batch of data several times, and then it's evaluated after learning the entire batch. 
Uh, recently, this approach has demonstrated much success. You can think of your methods like iCarl or end-to-end -end incremental learning. Uh, it actually makes the problem easier because these large batches are IID, which uh, helps with the catastrophic forgetting problem. However, as you can imagine, all of these things are slow, right? Uh, waiting for a batch of data to accumulate before learning, looping, and then evaluating after a batch is learned, these are all very slow. The other thing is that batches consisting of multiple classes, reducing the problem to IID learning isn't super realistic, right? That's not how humans learn, and we would like to do something that's a little bit more realistic. Um, so why doesn't incremental batch learning suffice? I think we can sort of all agree that in a real world application, agents are required to learn and uh, navigate in their environments uh, in real time, right? So you can think of a robot that's traveling around its environment. You would like it to immediately learn new information and then evaluate it on its information that's been learned. You could also think about smart home appliances where you would like it to learn uh, user behavior immediately and similarly web-based agents, right? Uh, so this is why we introduce online streaming learning or we use this paradigm. So in online streaming learning, our instances have temporal, temporal correlations in our non-IID. So you can think of the video stream sort of like what was just presented in the last talk, right? Uh, so at each time step, the learner receives one single new example. It learns that sample, and then it can be immediately evaluated instead of having to learn over these big batches. Similarly, we also allow the learner only a single epoch through the entire data set. So the advantages of this approach are that it is closer to how humans and animals learn, right? We learn from real-time perceptual sequence streams of data. New instances are learned immediately, which means we can evaluate our learner immediately, and it makes it better suited for real-time applications. But what about the catastrophic forgetting problem? This still happens in online learning. Um, so Replay has recently demonstrated much success in neural networks for mitigating forgetting. Uh, so we sort of already talked about this, but just briefly, uh, Replay involves storing a previous subset of examples. And then when your new example comes in, you mix it with all of your previous samples and you update the neural network by fine tuning it on this mixture of examples. And then you can make your prediction. So how is Replay actually implemented in current neural networks? Uh, well, people store a subset of raw images. You could think of storing maybe 100 images for each class. And the reason we store images is so that we can perform representation learning and update all of the convolutional layers in our network. Uh, researchers recently have been able to find that they've improved performance by using things like soft targets or distillation and data augmentation, right? However, as uh, the last talk mentioned, storing raw pixels is memory intensive, but it's also not biologically plausible. In fact, there's actually a couple differences with how uh, replay is implemented in human brains and how artificial neural networks implement it. Um, so there's two large gaps between how biological and artificial neural networks implement replay. Um, so hippocampal indexing theory postulates the hippocampus stores compressed representations of neocortical activity patterns, which then are reactivated during consolidation. Um, it also postulates that visual inputs are high in the visual processing hierarchy. You can think that you're not actually storing or learning uh, raw pixel representations, but rather some compressed representation. The second I sort of alluded to earlier is that animals engage in immediate online streaming learning from non-IID experiences, whereas current, uh, a lot of current lifelong learning networks are actually doing that incremental batch learning paradigm that I mentioned a couple minutes ago. So in order to overcome these two challenges, we present the Remind architecture. Uh, a preprint of our paper is available on archive if you're interested in more details. So Remind stands for Replay Using Memory Indexing, and it's a brain-inspired model that is consisting of two key ideas. Um, so the first key idea is to store compressed representations of intermediate layers. So you can think of storing some mid-level latent uh, CNN feature for Replay. Uh, and the second idea is to control the stability and plasticity by freezing part of the network. What I mean by this is if I extract some feature from the middle of the CNN, I could just freeze the layers before it and only update the uh, later layers of my network during incremental training. Um, storing compressed representations, uh, we say that this is sort of our implementation of hippocampal indexing theory, and we're gonna use tensor quantization to do that, which I'll talk about in just a minute. And then uh, by controlling the stability and plasticity of the network, we're only updating those high visual processing areas. So this is actually more similar to how uh, humans learn incrementally over time. 
So before we get started talking about Remind, I just kind of want to lay some foundational uh, notations so that we're all on the same page. Uh, so I'm going to denote my images by X. And then basically what I'm going to do is take a neural network and I'm going to decompose it into two sub networks, right? Um, so you can imagine that my first sub network consists of the earlier layers of the network, or I'm going to call them the frozen layers. And this is G. And then I also have my later layers, or these are going to be my plastic layers, and that's going to be called F. So you can imagine that if I do F of G of X, then I get the output or the predicted label for a given image. Um, I mentioned before that we're going to end up storing compressed representations from a mid a middle level of the CNN. Uh, I'm going to actually call those Z. So basically, if you push an image X through the layers G, then you'll get a representation Z. Um, we're going to do some quantization within here to store Z as a uh, low dimensional latent representation, which can then be uh, reconstructed into this Z prime that will actually be used to train these plastic layers of my network. So in order to do that, we're going to use a product quantization technique. So I want to talk to you a little bit just briefly about what product quantization is before we talk about the nitty gritty details of Remind. So in product quantization, let's imagine that I have 50,000 vectors that I would like to train my uh, network or my product quantizer on. They're each of 1024 dimensions. I've decided that I would like to train eight code books. So basically what this means is I'm going to take my 1024 dimensional vectors. I'm going to partition them into eight vectors of 128 dimensions each. Um, so then basically what we're going to do is actually train the product quantization model by training, uh, performing k-means clustering eight times, right? So I'm going to perform k-means clustering on this first subset of vectors and then perform k-means clustering on the second subset of vectors, et cetera. And this will basically provide me with a code book or a set of centroids that are representative of those 50,000 uh, vectors. So now our product quantizer has actually been trained. Um, and how can I use this to quantize new data? So given a new 1024 dimensional vector, I'm going to first partition it into eight subvectors, each of 128 dimensions, right? So I take this, I partition it into eight different subvectors, each of 128 dimensions, and then I'm going to find the index of the nearest centroid for each subvector. So you can imagine for this part of the subvector, I find its nearest index in the first code book, and then I'm going to record that, and then uh, for the second one, I'm going to find its nearest index and record that. And this basically allows us to store our vector as just eight indices with respect to a set of code books. So this significantly reduces our memory requirements. So let's talk about how Remind is actually trained. We break the training procedure into two separate stages. So the first stage I'm going to call base initialization. So you could imagine if I was performing incremental learning on the ImageNet data set that consists of a thousand classes, the base initialization stage would first consist of the uh, first 100 classes. So the first thing I'm going to do is take all the images for those first 100 classes, and I'm going to train my neural network just in a standard way offline. So basically what this is going to allow me to do is update the feature representation for my layers G, which are actually going to be frozen later during the streaming training. Um, so after I've updated my entire network on those first 100 classes in an offline manner, I'm going to then push all of those 100 classes of data through the frozen layers of G to extract these mid-level CNN features Z. And I'm going to use those in order to train my product quantization model. So this is going to allow me to represent these vectors as low dimensional lat uh, latent vectors, right? Um, so after I've trained my product quantization model, I then find all of the indices that represent all of those data in the first 100 classes. And I'm going to store those low dimensional representations along with ground truth labels in a replay buffer. Um, so now my base initialization stage has been completed and I can start doing my streaming learning. Uh, so given a new input image X, what I'm going to do is first pass it through my frozen layers G to extract that Z embedding. After that, I'm going to then uh, find its low dimensional latent representation using my product quantization model. And I'm going to select a random subset of previous data that are stored in my replay buffer. So basically, then what I'll do is take my current representation of my new data, a subset of previous examples of my old data. I'm going to push them through my product quantization model to reconstruct them. And then I'm going to use these 
uh, this small mini batch to update the plastic layers of F for a single iteration of gradient descent. Um, so we performed two different types of experiments. First, I want to talk about our classification experiments. So we perform classification on two data sets. The first is the ImageNet data set that consists of 1,000 classes. This has commonly been used for incremental learning problems, and we're going to evaluate it after every 100 classes have been learned. The second data set, we just had a nice introduction to that, is the Core 50 data set, and I like this better than ImageNet because it consists of natural images of people moving objects around with their hands. So this is a little bit more lifelike, and it actually lends itself nicely to the streaming problem. Uh, we compare against several different comparison models. I break these into two categories. So the first are these streaming models that operate similar to Remind. The first is deep streaming linear discriminant analysis, and the second is extreme. So both of these models operate on examples one at a time, and they are only allowed a single epoch through the data set. However, SLDA and Extreme can only update uh, linear layers of a network. So if we're using a convolutional network like ResNet, it means it can only update the last final uh, fully connected layer of the network. The other models that we compare against are these batch models. And all of these are able to perform incremental batch learning by training all the way back to the images. Um, so these are your methods like iCarl, the Unified Classifier, and BIC. Um, they're the current state of the art for incremental image net. And basically, they all combine replay with a distillation loss and then perform a little bit of uh, trickery on top of that to, get, to glean a little bit of extra performance. Uh, we're then going to compare everything against an offline model that's basically trained offline on all of your data. And this is just going to serve as an upper bound on our model performance. Uh, so let's take a look at our ImageNet results. Um, so on the left, uh, you can see that this is the performance of iCarl, Unified BIC, and Remind as trained in an incremental batch in a, stream, in a streaming setting. Uh, so if we take a look at the incremental batch results, what we can see is methods like iCarl, Unified, and BIC all have relatively high performance, with BIC performing the best. If we tr train Remind in this incremental batch setting, we're actually only 1.9% lower than the state-of-the-art BIC model, which is fantastic. However, what you see is that as soon as we start training these models in the streaming paradigm, performance significantly degrades, right? BIC drops by over 40%, uh, whereas Remind is able to maintain high performance for both the incremental batch and the streaming paradigm. Uh, on the right, what I'm showing you is the incremental or the uh, streaming learning curve for each of these models. So what you see is that Remind here in orange is performing fairly well uh, over time without forgetting as much as some of these other models. Uh, next, we ran a series of Core 50 experiments. For brevity, I'm only presenting one experiment here. Uh, if you're interested in more, you can check out our paper. Um, but basically, what we wanted to do is compare Remind against several of these multi-headed baselines that basically require the task label to be provided at test time. Uh, you can think of a lot of your regularization baselines that follow this paradigm, like synaptic intelligence or elastic weight consolidation. And so we ran these experiments in two settings. The first is where task labels were not available, and the second is where task labels were available. So basically, what you see is that overall, Remind performs the best in both settings, but that methods like EWC and AGEM perform significantly worse when task labels were not provided to them uh, during training or testing. Uh, next, we wanted to run something a little bit different. So we actually performed some visual question and answering experiments. So in visual question answering, you're going to provide your agent with an image and a natural language question. And then basically, you require the AI system to provide you an answer to the question. So what is the mustache made of? The, uh, agent would be required to output the output bananas. Um, so how do we set this up for a streaming paradigm, right? So our input stream now, instead of consisting of only images, is going to be consisting of an image plus a question. So for example, this picture of a dog, and it's going to say, what color is the dog? And then you're going to require the agent to say white. Uh, in order to test the robustness of models, we tested everything under two different data ordering scenarios. So the first is random or IID, where basically we just shuffled all of the data uh, randomly, and then the agent learned them one at a time. I think the more interesting ordering is where we organized everything by question type. So basically, you would learn one type of question first, and then you would be required to learn another question type, uh, et cetera, as time goes on. Um, so in order to perform our VQA experiments, we ran, the, uh, we ran everything on two different data sets that test for two different things. 
Uh, so the first is the TDIUC data set that tests generalization across different tasks. You can see there's questions regarding scene classification or activity recognition and counting. And these are natural images. On the right, you'll see this popular clever data set that basically tests for multi-step compositional reasoning. So basically it's these uh, synthetically generated images that ask questions about the relationships between different objects in the image. So first I'm gonna to present to you our TDIUC results. On the left, I'm basically showing you the overall model performance for both the IID and question type orderings. You can see that Remind performs the best in both of these scenarios. What's even more interesting is that it performs about the same across the two orderings, showing that it's robust to the order in which the data is actually being presented, which is great because that's what you would want for a streaming learner. On the right, I'm showing you the learning curve for the uh, question type ordering. So you can basically see that as Remind learns new questions over time, it's actually pretty closely tracking the offline learner, which is uh, fantastic. I think the more interesting results, though, are what we found on the Clever data set. So again, on the left, I'm showing you overall performance for the IID and question type orderings. And what you can see is that Remind actually performs significantly better uh, when the data is organized by question type than when it is just randomly organized. We hypothesize that this is happening because we think that the question type ordering might actually be serving as a sort of curriculum, allowing Remind to uh, benefit in training in this ordering scenario. On the right, you can see again for the question type ordering, it's almost identical to the offline training, which is remarkable. Uh, so in conclusion, we propose the Remind architecture. It stores compressed mid-level CNN features as indices in a replay buffer, which is inspired by hippocampal indexing theory. We then show experiments uh, with Remind outperforming existing models on both the ImageNet and Core 50 data sets. And then we use Remind to pioneer visual question answering. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank my co-authors. Several of them are on the call today and also our sponsors who helped fund this research. Uh, and with that, uh, that's the end of my talk. So I guess we're having the discussion in a little bit, but I'll just remind you that our paper is available on archive if you're interested in more information. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Taylor, uh, for your great talk. Um, maybe I have just a quick question. Uh, so yeah. how do you handle, let's say, the replay buffer? Uh, do you have like a fixed size for these um, indexes that you keep um, or you, you you let these external memory grow over time? I mean, what's the policy to add new examples of this memory? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I probably should have mentioned this, but basically what we do, sorry, this thing keeps popping up. Um, we basically give all of the models the same memory requirement in gigabytes. So you can see we gave each of these models 1.5 gigabytes of auxiliary memory. Um, so this basically allowed uh, models that stored raw images to store about 10,000 raw images, whereas Remind is able to store compressed representations of a lot more. Um, is to, so basically we would fill the buffer until it's full, and then if it was full and you wanted to add a new example, we would randomly kick out uh, an example from our buffer. Okay, great. Yeah. Does anyone have a, a quick question for Taylor? Um... Uh, I have a quick question. Uh, uh, so uh, this is also a version of uh, compressed replay, right? I mean, some kind of compressed replay. So yeah. iCall is also a standard image comp image replay. So so my question is, uh, how is I mean, what part of your model uh, has caused I mean significant improvement over these I mean standard models? I mean, what part of your technique is it? Yes. I mean, uh, is it just okay. more compressed uh, uh, samples for the same amount of space or something else? Yeah, so I mean, we definitely glean a lot of performance gain out of being able to store a larger number of compressed examples. Um, we also ran several ablation studies uh, in our paper, but we also, I didn't talk about it, but we use a version of mix-up on the quantized tensors, which actually gives us some performance gain as well. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that our biggest thing is probably being able to store more compressed representations. Okay, okay. thank you. Cool, thank you again, Tyler, uh, for your talk. Thank and you. Maybe we can move to the next uh, spotlight, not so spotlight presentation from German Parisi. German, are you here? I have seen you before joining. I am here. Let me Great. see if I can. 
So you can um, hit the present now button on the bottom right of your screen. You should be able to see that. Yeah. Um, I and then you that. can use your screen or your entire desktop or a, or a specific window as well. Okay, now you're seeing your slides, right? Great, full screen, right? Yes. Awesome. Great, so good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Um, I'm Herman Parisi. Thank you, Vincenzo, for giving us this space to present our interesting and crazy ideas um, around continual learning. So I wanted to bring a, a bit of different perspective of what I've been working on, what I work on during my PhD and, and, and so on. And uh, I think this should complement pretty good um, the, the approaches that uh, we've seen today. And it's more about how we um, design continual learning approaches for, for um, robotics. Um, yeah, my, my, before I start, so my webcam is not working, so I do have a, a very good and a very bad picture of myself at the end of the talk, um, so okay. you know who you're talking to. Right, so let's start with continual learning research questions. So these are the research questions that we are, um, let's say, sharing in uh, our continual learning, um, continual AI research page, which are the, the questions that we believe are interesting um, and it still represent um, open challenges. And um, we know there's, there's a lot of um, studies around what are the key principles and mechanisms uh, that yield learning in the brain, so lifelong learning in the brain, and the reason why, um, well, mostly in neuroscience and so on, people just refer to learning. So it's kind of implicit that the learning process is continuous. Um, and then I would like to focus on the second and the third one, which is how do we actually model continual learning approaches that better capture the flexibility, robustness, and, scale, um, and are scalable as the biological systems. And um, the reason why I'm interested in this is to actually be able to deploy these continual learning systems into embodied agents or robots that can interact and learn from um, a highly dynamic environment. So it can be very challenging to, to have um, these complex learning agents that can learn from, from the environment. Um, and of course, the last question is very important as well. So for the moment, we want to deploy continual learning systems. How do we do it responsibly and ethically? But that's, that's a different discussion. So we think of two important biological aspects of learning. Um, I think everybody here is very familiar with the concept of plasticity and the um, theory regarding complementary learning systems. So if you think about it, um, the way the brain works is, is that learning occurs by changing neural weights and uh, there must be a stability, plasticity balance in which a system is plastic enough to learn from new experiences and also stable enough not to forget what's been learned. And uh, sorry, my alarm clock is all right. And if we think about how um, memory is, is believed to work, and um, in particular long-term memory consolidation, we have here the interplay between the hippocampus and the neocortex as a way to achieve um, long-term memory consolidation. So on the one hand, the hippocampus is um, believed to have, to yield fast learning of um, arbitrary information. So remember any kind of event. Whereas the neocortex is more about slow learning of structured knowledge. And uh, we have a lot of studies supporting this theory. And um, we also have recent studies showing that also the hippocampus is able to, to perform some slow learning of stru structured knowledge as well. But anyway, schematically, um, this theory is very interesting. And this is um, a theory that a lot of us have taken inspiration from for um, modeling our, our own algorithms. In terms of neural networks, um, there's a lot of different architectures and, and paradigms uh, that have been proposed to, let's say, um, mitigate catastrophic forgetting. 
And uh, if, we, if I can just provide a summary of them, it's mostly about regularization methods that will freeze synapses at um, uh, neurons that have already learned something. So that's the way you can protect knowledge. Or you can also protect knowledge by, by through network expansion. That means that um, as soon as you have to learn something new, you may want to extend or yeah, expand your network and allocate new um, you know, resources. Um, so you don't have to override previous ones. Or you can have um, something in between in which you can both expand the network and also update previous um, ways, weights that have been um, learned before. And of course, on top of this, you can have additional um, replay mechanisms that we have seen in the previous presentations that can help mitigate catastrophic forgetting, especially in scenarios of streaming learning and uh, or learning from small batches. And that really represents um, a challenge also for for a state of the art in continuous learning. Now, if we instead think more about um, what continuous learning could mean in agents and robots, we do have here um, agents that should progressively acquire, fine tune, and transfer knowledge and skills. Um, and these skills and knowledge are acquired uh, through the interaction with the environment. And we know how complex the environment can be in the real world. And um, here I summarize some of the challenges that are involved um, in this task. And um, if we think about it, we can start with the fact that data in nature is sequential. So we have rich streams of high dimensional non-IID data from which we have to learn continuously. Um, also the fact that we might not have any task, we, we shouldn't have any task boundaries or we may have no teaching signals or very sparse teaching signals and we should learn also in the absence of these teaching signals. And uh, a very realistic assumption is that we have bounded resources, both in terms of computation and storage. So it means that if we have to learn in an online fashion, we have to take into account like um, how much computational complexity we have and how much um, memory we have to use, right? Because we know that a lot of approaches um, that perform um, for instance, memory replay tend to store a lot of information that is then replayed um, to a network, but that has a memory cost that we would like to minimize. And that's how we have to come up with um, a better way to design experience replay or memory replay, which could, can be done in terms of having replay buffers or as um, thing was mentioned by Gabriele, to have more generative, generative models that are able to generate um, some kind of representation that can be replayed to the network to, to prevent catastrophic forgetting. And here, this is all these um, aspects that I'm mentioning about learning have a lot to do both with online, what, what's called online continual learning and streaming learning. So there, there's a lot of overlap here, um, you know, with continual learning, online continual learning and, and streaming learning. And um, this is a problem that I, I started studying back in actually yeah 2016 when still continual learning was a thing uh, well established field but a lot of the work that we have available today was not there and um, I was interested in understanding how to um, learn from sequences uh, more specifically from from action sequences so all my PhD was about um, human action recognition with um, the neural network self-organization, so unsupervised learning. And I was interested in see how, um, how much I could learn from these sequences in an online fashion without forgetting. Um, and this is, without really going into detail, this is just an example of a hierarchical architecture that is um, combining posture and motion features um, to then have a more complex representation of actions. Um, and this is to some extent, to some extent with a lot of oversimplification, modeling what it's happening in the brain in terms of uh, recognizing human motion. So we have the ventral pathway and the dorsal pathway that then are combined, the STS. And um, I was interesting to see how much forgetting I have if I have to learn incrementally. So if I have to learn 10 actions, um, so which is basically a classification task that I perform with um, unsupervised self-organizing networks. 
But of course, in these experiments, I do have some forgetting, um, even if um, something that I am, let's say, a fan of is neurogenesis. So I'm very interested in seeing how we can mitigate catastrophic forgetting neural networks um, through the use of you know, uh, neuro, yeah, neurogenesis. So I was using growing when required networks that actually allocate um, new neural resources whenever you have novel information to be um, to be learned from. And um, I performed some experiments um, showing the difference and the actually the advantages of using growing networks over using static networks and also how actually a replay can, can be um, an additional mechanism to uh, improve even further the performance of, of a growing network. Um, and that's something that I, I then extended with um, additional replay mechanisms. So uh, at the time I was also interested in, in core 50 and that's actually how I started corresponding with Vincenzo. And um, I implemented this, um, let's say simple um, <laughs> um, framework in which I have the interaction between the episodic memory and semantic memory. So which is two stack self-organized networks that can grow and um, learn from temporally correlated data. In this case, um, video sequences from, from core 50. And as I said before, so um, I was interested in, in, in using neurogenesis, but at the same time, of course, if you're learning from, from complex data or high dimensional data, um, something that I think is very uh, intuitive is to combine this kind of more complex architectures or growing architectures with um, pre-trained networks, right? So with any kind of pre-trained convolutional feature extractors that allow you to have um, some degree of, yeah, you can extract features and you know that those layers are not gonna change. So they're frozen during the whole learning process. Whereas you have layers in your, in the higher part of your hierarchy, which are instead changing and adapting to, to the input. And um, based on some experiments that I conducted on Core 50, I empirically um, found that, in fact, neurogenesis can be a very interested um, mechanism to mitigate forgetting. And um, in this case, having replay also helps a lot. Um, and um, let me actually maybe show, I wanted to show more the, uh, uh, bit of formulas behind this, but I think I'm gonna have it here. Anyway, um, yeah. So how? So the, the, the interesting part here is um, how actually I use these networks also to um, produce latent replay. So what I do is what I was doing is um, not really replaying raw um, pixels, but instead replaying to the network um, the internal representations. Of the network itself, and um, I think that's um, something. I was quite sure that I have. Oh yeah, I think I skipped this slide. There we go. So the interesting part of the thing was to combine all the the fact that I wanted to learn from sequences and I wanted to do that in a continuous learning fashion. So the idea here was to have um, a growing self-organizing network that can process the. Uh, your input, so you have the network is basically composed by weights and, and context descriptors, um, where actually k is giving you your temporal depth, so how many frames you want to process in the past. So given a input, a real input, x of t, what you do basically is you you can compute um, your best matching unit, the network, which is computed as um, weighted contribution between the current and the past, so the present and the past. Um, and this, anyway, allows you to have um, a pretty compressed representation of, of, your, of your temporal input. And um, then we have a competitive Hebe learning step in which we do adapt with the, both the weights and the context descriptors of the network. Um, so here we have epsilon, which is a learning rate, a constant learning rate, and a habituation. Um, counter. Basically, um, the neurons of this network can also be habituated. Uh, and that's basically to, you do, you do so to protect knowledge, right? So you want that um, neurons that have been trained um, sufficiently, you don't want to change them 
too quickly when you have novel information. You would rather actually create novel neurons. And um, well, I don't really have here what the mechanisms are, so which the criteria are to, to expand your network, but this is more or less the, the important equations of, of what's going on in, in those networks. And then here's how, actually how you can also model intrinsic replay, so through neural reactivation. So how you actually, this network also learns what are the transitions between neurons. So starting from an onset neuron, you can actually reconstruct neural trajectories. So you can reactivate that trajectory. And from those, you can actually create um, reactivation patterns that can be replayed to the network. So to both networks, so to the episodic memory and to the semantic memory, which is basically what's happening here, um, in which these green arrows indicate that those reactivation patterns are replayed to both networks. Um, and yeah, so this experiment showed that um, it was very hard also for me to, to um, compare this, um, these experiments with, with other approaches. So um, I do have additional experiments that compare the performance of this method with um, others. Um, but my main, let's say, goal with, with this kind of networks was also to perform unsupervised learning for, for prediction. So an additional use of these kind of networks is not only um, classification of objects or human actions is for me was more about the fact of being able to predict what's going to happen. So how people are going to, so which kind of actions people are going to perform in the future and uh, to be able to assess those actions, right? So once you have this kind of, you know, networks learning, um, given training patterns of motion, whatever you're giving afterwards, so onset motion and so on, you can predict what's going to happen next. And from there, you can understand whether that motion is being performed correctly or not. And you can do this in an online fashion as well. So the idea here is if you think about more human-robot interaction scenarios in which you have an agent or robot learning um, by imitation and so on, you can have this robot understanding the kind of motions that people are doing and then being able to, to perform um, those actions itself. But going back to continual learning for robotics, so, so far we, we have, I think we have all talked about classification and um, in this case also motion prediction, but there are also additional factors or components of learning that are very interesting for, for think, well, when we think about continual learning for, for autonomous agents and robots. Um, and more specifically, what I, what I think is worth discussing about is these main four components that are very complementary to any kind of continual learning approach that we want to um, design for for an agent. Um, and if we think about um, how the, the, the stability plasticity dilemma, right? So it's a dilemma because you would like to have a system that, that is plastic enough to learn over time but then stable enough not to forget. Um, and then if you think about how, how the brain works or how we believe the brain works based on empirical evidence and so on, we know that we may, that it's, we could argue that there's critical periods of learning when we are, um, you know, in the first two years in which we're, our brain is very plastic. It's like a sponge, it really learns from, from a lot of, it, it learns a lot from experience and so on and, and, and how that, uh, those levels of plasticity then tend to decrease um, over time. It's being, it's being shown that actually our brain really stays plastic. It's just, it's just, yeah, it stays plastic for our entire lifespan. But of course, it is harder to learn when, when you're old. And how actually um, the complexity of the task you can learn can grow over time, right? So in the very beginning, what, you're able, what you are able to learn may not be as complex as what you can learn later. So in that case, if we think about this um, within some kind of computational framework, we can think of developmental and curriculum learning in which um, we do have critical peers of learning, which can, can benefit um, you know, network learning. There's some very interesting experiments about it in which they show how critical peers of learning in convolutional neural networks can really help le learn quicker on a subsequent step. And also in the same fashion, how having a learning curriculum can also help um, you know, networks learn faster in the future, right? So if you start from simple tasks, 
and then you show the network more complex tasks, how that learning procedure can be um, optimized. And transfer learning is also very important because you want to make sure that whatever you're learning today can also be used um, in the future. So you have both, both forward and backward learning, uh, transfer learning. In that sense, you want to make sure that when you learn a task A and a task B, learning task B no, no, um, is not so learning task B is not making you forget task A, actually maybe learning task B makes you improve your performance for task A and vice versa, um, which is, I think, a very important challenge. Um, and there, there are a couple of continual learning um, papers and, and approaches that actually um, use transfer learning also as a metric to evaluate their methods. Um, I, would like, I would like to see more of those because I think it is very important to to see how much of the knowledge that the network is learning can be reused to learn future tasks. And then we think about also in the fashion of developmental psychology, um, we know that we feed our networks with um, external input with data sets and so on. Although if we think about um, autonomous robots um, and agents, we know that it would be very interesting if um, their behavior can be um, uh, driven by the interplay between ex, um, external and internal reward, right? So we have the varmin that provides a lot of stimuli and um, in terms of intrinsic motivation, we know that we can generate goals. Um, so uh, intrinsic reward that actually also helps the agent um, develop um, exploration strategies that are driven by the internal reward rather than uh, external reward. And that can be extremely important in agents that have to learn from the interaction with environment and they're not giving um, a lot of teach teaching signals. They're ready to have to learn through the critical process of self-exploration. And uh, there's really interesting work by, for example, by Udaye in, in this field in which you want to combine all these components of continual learning and intrinsic motivation for agents to learn over time through um, self-exploration. And finally, something that is very interesting um, as not only in relation to continual learning and, and ag um, agents, but is the presence of cross-model learning or multi-sensory learning. So if we, if we think about robots that learn from a race of sensors like cameras and, and microphones and so on, um, we do have as humans as well, <laughs> the, the capacity to integrate multisensory information, which yields robust perception and behavior. So whenever we have to undertake um, behavioral, um, yeah, decisions, um, we do integrate multiple um, sensory information from, from like in this in this case from audio vision or haptics and so on. And multisensory integration is is a lifelong process. That means that whatever we learn is also used to modulate. Um, multi-sensory information. And importantly, in, in agents and robots can be used for conflict resolution. That means that um, it is very much more likely to have sensory uncertainty and uh, um, it's very challenging for robots to learn from noise environmental conditions. So in this case, we can use multi-sensory integration to, to solve those conflicts. So something we were interested in um, a couple of years ago was to understand how people use multi-sensory integration to solve conflicts, and especially how their prior knowledge can really modulate um, that integration process. So if you think about, um, for example, a very simple phenomenon, which is called ventriloquism effect, that means that when you have a visual stimulus and you have an auditory stimulus, the um, perception of the spatial location of that auditory stimulus can be shifted towards um, the location of the visual one, because vision is more um, dominant in that sense. And this is true for um, a lot of studies that have been done with um, light dots and uh, simple sounds. But in this case, we wanted to, to go a bit further and to extend that and see how much your prior knowledge of the environment and of the world actually can modulate that. So we just modeled this very simple environment in which we have um, animated avatars that can move their lips or raise their, their arms. And then we have speakers behind them to produce um, human sounds. And basically we found um, that of course, um, vision is dominating 
Um, and importantly, we also found that if you learn something about the world, so something new, uh, any new piece of knowledge would actually modulate the way you solve that conflict. So we were interested in, in actually understanding how we can better model this, um, these learning factors into an agent. Because I think we often focus on um, the fact that we do have um, data sets uh, with, with well-defined um, images and so on, but it is also true that if you think about an agent operating in the real world, you also have to understand what you want to pay attention to. So you will have an overwhelming amount of information that comes to the agent, and so you want to know what you should be focusing on and how to solve, in this case, um, sensory conflicts. So what we did here was to just to have a very simple, straightforward convolutional architecture in which you're feeding your, your network with what is the, the audio and the visual features. And um, we were able to replicate human-like behavior in the agent. Now, the reason why I'm showing this, this is this architecture is not has nothing to do with continual learning. The question is, how do you extend this in a more continual learning fashion? Because here, um, we're talking about a supervised architecture from which you know we have the teaching signals, we know what the behavior is, but it, the question is more about how do you create um, how do you propose um, specific architecture that learns this kind of behavior in a continual learning fashion, right? So you don't want to have teaching signals. You just want to have your agent learning from, from the environment. And just like it, it happens in humans and animals, you want to have multi-sensor integration as a life lear learning process. So whatever the agent is learning over time also modulates the multi-sensor integration process. So back then, the proposal was to have to take inspiration from what's also happening in the brain, in which humans do combine um, spatial and associative learning representations in a lifelong learning fashion. So we could use this kind of um, the same growing network architectures to to model this more complex framework in which we can combine um, audiovisual representations of the, the spatial representations for multi-sensor integration with higher level representations than in this case would come. Um, so if you think about the diagram on, on the left, that is describing um, very in a very simplistic way um, what is happening in the brain in which we do have visual and auditory um, stimuli, which are processed on the one hand by the visual and the auditory cortex, and that goes up all the way to the temporal cortex. Uh, whereas you also have um, multi-sensory processing in the brain in um, mid in the midbrain areas such as the superior curriculus. In that case, the representations you're processing are very simplified, and how actually the temporal cortex and midbrain actually um, communicate to, to to really understand where your attention should be should be placed. So I think this is this is another kind of kind of um, let's say applications are very interesting for for applying continual learning in, in agents and robots and actually for, for, for seeing how we can better, um, let's say, reuse the architectures that we've been, that, that you know, people have been proposing around and, and use it in different, in different domains. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, as I said, so, uh -huh. I haven't changed my profile picture in, in a while, five years, um, but this is what I look like today. That's, yeah, so happy to answer any questions and I hope I provide an interesting overview and uh, pointers to think about. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I really enjoyed the talk. So maybe I can start by breaking the ice now and so that we can start this debate or at least have some questions from the other guys. Um, so, German, uh, I have noticed that you think so. Why do you think this is important for a continual learning algorithm? That sorry, you sorry. Have... I, I lost you. When you started talking, I lost you. So, you oh. have to repeat that again. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I have a very bad connection. Um, so, uh, I was asking. Since I've noticed that uh, you make a lot of uh, 
reference, uh, let's say, debated uh, in, in the neuroscience community. And, and I was wondering why do you think these are important to develop you know, continual learning algorithms that in the end are going to run on silicon? So, well, I lost you again, but I think that your question is why I think that these um, neurophysiological aspects of learning are important for when we model artificial systems. Is yes. that the question? Yes. yes. Yeah, well, the reason why I think, um, of course, if we think about the brain, that's you know the best learning machine you have out there. So I think it's, it's very intuitive that if we want to take inspiration from a learning system, the brain is probably the way to go. Um, I think that you can take inspiration from from the way the brain works in you know to, to different um, degrees of detail without getting lost on how you know um, neurons and so on actually work. But in particular for continual learning, I think it's very important to 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 take inspiration from from these kind of methods because um, it it also depends in what kind of application you're trying to model, right? So I think that if, if you're thinking about learning agents and robots that do operate in complex environments, um, it is, I think it's crucial to understand how the brain um, is, is learning from that, right? Yeah. Um, I think you can, in particular, if you want to take a look at big picture, I think that many of us um, sometimes rightfully focus on a small sub-problem of learning, but then when it comes to, you know, looking at the big picture and for example, before I, I summarize like what I think are the four challenges of you know, continu on online continuing learning. So temporal data, um, learning from you know, without teaching signals and uh, you know, having boundaries in computation memory and, and then having some kind of experience replay mechanism when you have to learn from one pass of your data. So when it comes to putting all those components together and say, how do I propose a continuing learning approach that is you know tackling all these four points i think it's very interesting uh, it's very important that you take a look at how the brain is solving that um i think it's also important to understand the limitations of you know any computational framework you're using because as i said it's, it's i think it's very easy to from the moment you're looking at the brain it's very easy to get lost in all the details and complexity of the brain so it's important to keep always um a given level of abstraction from that right so it happened to me a lot of times going to, um, you know, different conferences and saying that my model was, um, you know, inspired by biology. And of course, questions were like, well, how can you talk about by inspiration if you're not modeling spiking neurons? And that's a very valid question. So whereas instead in our community, like computer science community, it's, it's very common to abuse um, terminology from your science. And that, that's fine. So, right, I, I think. And... Um, I think as long as you're saying that your algorithm is by inspire or rather that, you know, really mimicking what's happening in the brain, that's good. But I think that especially for, for continual learning, it's important that we really extensively study the neuroscience literature to get some, some, some inspiration. And as I said, it's, you know, sometimes you, you get questions like, um, guys, where, where I can find um, papers about continual learning um, in your science, well, it's, you just search for learning. That's what you should. So learning is continual. Uh, I really like your last sentence. So I, let's just stop here <laughs> for this question. And um, so uh, are there any other questions to the four speakers that we had today? Yes, uh, can I ask one question? Sure. I, I'm Mike um, Nimbo. Um, very, very, very nice talk. So, um, and uh, this is especially for for German. Um, so, um, I wonder what is the uh, kind of the typical way to formulate uh, intrinsic motivation um, or internal reward. Oh, that's a very interesting one, and uh, that's a very good question in general, but a very bad question for me because intrinsic motivation is not my field of study. <laughs> um, but of course, I can answer that by. First of all, by saying if you are interested in, in intrinsic motivation, there's actually great work by, as I said before, Uda Ye and also in the past people like Ashmin Hoover. Um, but the way you do it is you want to model that intrinsic reward by just, you know, um, you can maximize the amount of learning you get from, from one specific situation. So instead of um, thinking of, you know, external reward that 
reward that you get from the environment, you can think of intrinsic motivation as a reward that actually uh, you get when you're learning something, right? So there's um, very different ways to model that. Um, as I said, I, I'm not really aware of the details and if I have to maybe go into some of the approaches or no, the, the answer would be real long. So something I, I could recommend is like, we can take this offline and I can give you some pointers, of course. Um, it's not that I want to advertise our review paper, but in our review paper of continuing learning with neural networks, there's a section which is dedicated to to um, intrinsic motivation. And in particular, I would like to say that um, there's a lot of approaches that use intrinsic motivation as you know a way to to provide self exploration. But something that is not being explored is how do you um, use that kind of paradigm in a continual learning framework which yeah, is something exactly. that I think we should be studying in the next years. Totally, I think that's very exciting, and so that's so why I'm very curious. So I'll ask you questions so maybe offline. Thank you. Thank you. Right, do you have any other question? Uh, so I have a question. Uh, so uh, this is to uh, Roger, I think, the first data set paper, I think open Lorentz data set. Yep. So among the four metrics that were specified, the accuracy metrics, why do we need forward accuracy average for continuous learning model? Yeah, that's the question. Roger, are you still here? Did you go to sleep? <laughs> uh, can you see? Uh, yeah, it's still, it's still here. Roger, are you still here? I think he just left the meeting like three seconds ah, okay. ago. Right now. <laughs> okay. okay, well, I, I can take that. I mean, uh, hey, I hello. think that's... Uh... Hey, uh, Roger, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, he's exactly. here. He's so, here. yeah, right. my connection is really... Yeah, it's really bad. So, uh, yeah, for the four metrics, I think uh, uh, it's because we, uh, we think the continuous learning should consider uh, different kind of metrics. For one one important is the, for the backward transfer, as the German talk about. So that's why we learn uh, after we learning the new task. How can we? How can our, our system perform on the older task? So that's the first metric BWT. Another one is the FWT, is the forward transfer. Um, the, this uh, this kind of metric is describing how our model can transfer the old knowledge to the new task. So this is another metric. Another so, one, uh, the third one is about the instantaneous learning. So it's, it's just like the uh, normal uh, deep learning accuracies. So you training and testing on the IID data set. So, uh, so it's a current task performance. The last one is actually the average of all the um, backward transfer, forward transfer, and the current task. So this is the mean, and um, you, you can view it as a mean accuracy. So I think. Uh, so the I mean regarding the forward transfer, uh, the forward forward tasks are the tasks that the model has not yet seen. Mm -hmm. I mean the learning uh, process has not yet come across. Yeah. So yes. when we have to see forward transfer, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Uh, so as you see, so you if you want to uh, do some transfer learning, actually you didn't know your uh, target domain that's, that's actually. So you, you, you may have some prior knowledge that uh, you will encounter some similar domain or uh, task, but you still didn't have a new, new data set, right? Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's just like the unsupervised domain adaptation problem. Yeah, you, you can you can search for the paper title like that, unsupervised domain adaptation. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, you have a turn. Right, so maybe I have another question to the...
coming with sequential streaming data. So why do you think, especially maybe uh, Gabriele and Tyler, uh, why do you think uh, we need you know, these streaming continual learning algorithms? Uh, why don't we just uh, wait just a little and we create a batch of data, we shuffle this data, we have a, let's say, roughly uh, IAD content in this data, and then we update uh, our, our models based on, on those data. What's, what's the limiting factor here? I guess, I mean, I can chime in. So, I mean, I certainly think that it's plausible that you could wait for a small mini batch of data to queue up before learning. Um, I guess it depends how long you're willing to wait to queue up data right. before you want to learn, right? Um, certainly you could, you know, if you're waiting only 50 samples at a time, it's probably not that much time to wait, um, but also not much is happening within those, uh, depending at the frame rate that you're collecting your videos, right? So. Um, you still might you still might not have a super IID batch, um, so you're still going to be susceptible to forgetting. Um, I think it is important that people develop these algorithms that don't require, you know, the current ImageNet batched models require 100 classes at a time, which is over 130,000 examples. And I think that that's a little bit less realistic, but I certainly think, um, you know, small small batches like 50 samples or something like that certainly could be a little bit more realistic, especially if you're trying to do real-time learning. I don't know if anyone else has anything else to chime on that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I agree with Tyler. And uh, yeah, of course we can wait uh, for data uh, to have a more IED batch. But uh, yeah, in my opinion, it all depends on uh, how much time we want to wait and uh, all depend on the distribution of data because uh, if we have an agent for example that uh, for a long period of time sees uh, almost the same kind of data or very very similar data it's quite useless to wait uh, for data to queue it's uh, more uh, um, it's better to uh, train the model on the data that you have and uh, update them as soon as possible uh, it, it, it depends. It depends on the on the scenario. It depends on the topic. It depends on the on the kind of data that you have. Uh, but in my opinion, uh, it's, uh, it's more natural and it's more biologically inspired. It's more natural, yeah, to have uh, some this kind of streaming data and deal with it. So, thank you. Thank you so much. So, do we have uh, other questions? Yes, I have one. Right. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Uh, I have a question, perhaps both for Gabrielli and Tyler. Um, in Gabrielli's presentation, you mentioned that you do backpropagate uh, the new data that you collected. Uh, and whereas in Tyler, if I understand correctly, the model is frozen on the G part. Uh, so that means uh, when you pass new data, whatever you store, those representations don't change in Tyler's cases. Uh, but in Gabrielis, those representations change. So that means that whatever you're storing on your replay uh, may not be accurate at some point. And the reason why I ask that is um, a good application for continual learning is data privacy. So a lot of the times companies don't store images, but they do store uh, embeddings or some latent representation. Uh, so I want to know for Gabrielli, do you think that has an impact for these types of companies uh, to have such latent representation uh, that is always changing? If you understand what I mean, my question. Yes, yes, I, I try to answer the first part of the question first. So, uh, yeah, uh, the network below, the, 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 um, the bottom part of the network slightly changes. Okay. We can modulate its change so we can use a um, um, very, very little learning rate, small learning rate, sorry. Uh, we can, uh, for example, change only the uh, batch statistics. So the batch normalization statistic and do not uh, touch the weights. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, if we don't block the bottom part of the network, uh, uh, the representation that we store, the hidden representation uh, became become old over time. Uh, we refresh the memory. Uh, so we insert a new pattern in the memory, 
uh, but uh, maybe I can present uh, something that would be better. Okay. Do you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, if you if you see here, all the um, the, um, the latent replay curves have this slight decreasing in accuracy at the end. This is the effect of the aging of the pattern uh, for many reasons. So uh, at the end, it's more uh, the, the network is more sensitive for for of this aging. And there, there are many reasons of this, but this is the effect of uh, uh, having uh, uh, pattern that uh, are aging, so are not uh, are not fresh because the uh, this part of the network uh, slightly change. We have tried to also block all the all, all the all, all this part of the network, so use it as feature extractor. Uh, of course, the accuracy. Uh, we, of, of course, you don't have this uh, phenomenon here. Uh, but he, yeah, you, you, I, you're, you're right. Uh, if you don't block the network, you, you have some problem with storing latent activations. And for the second part of your question about privacy, uh, well, I'm not really, really into the privacy. I'm not really into the um, all the issues about privacy, etc. But uh, I don't know if you store uh, um, network activation, you shouldn't have many problems of privacy. I, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I'm... that's correct. So companies okay. uh, at least are allowed to store these embeddings. But okay. uh, if we do keep changing them uh, through time, okay. then these embeddings also become useless. Yeah. So yeah. that's why, like, uh, I think an approach that goes into just having fixed representations in the mm -hmm. bottom part can be stronger, at least for application. Yeah, 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 totally, totally. In fact, we in our application that uh, was presented by my my friend here, Lorenzo, the, a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, we, we 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 made an app, an application using this uh, this kind of uh, this kind of model, and the bottom part here it's uh, it fixed for for performance and for increasing uh, at um, uh, increasing the the accuracy at, um, at the maximum so we don't have this phenomenon of uh, uh, slightly decreasing at the end of the training all the curves okay. of the latent replay yeah thank you yeah great to see that you guys explored that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you Cool. So I think we are now into two hours of these meetups. So I think we can stop here. Of course, if you have uh, any questions uh, to the authors, uh, to the speakers that we have listened to today, you can send them an email or you can contact them uh, through the Continual AI uh, Slack workspace in which they are holding. And of course, we are going to create also a topic on our forum discourse where I invite the authors of these talks to upload their slides uh, so we, we continue and continue his discussion on, on our forum. So thank you all again for joining. And I hope you to see again uh, in the next meetup. We're organizing this meetup every month. And uh, also in our reading group sessions, we're gonna have uh, these for next Friday and all we have all Fridays. So thank you again for joining. Thank you again for our speakers. And, and I hope to have a good evening or good day <laughs> during the other time zone. Bye. Thank you. Grazie thank Vincenzo. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Great talk. Thanks.